we're going to talk to you today a little bit about CWF's presence at the Impact Congress, which was the third International Marine Protected Area Congress. It was in France at the end of October, and we sent it rather why we were there, what we were doing, what it looked like, and then if you have any questions or comments at the end. Yep. So just real quick then, can you click Marine protected areas are sort of a, a hot topic for marine issues and marine conservation right now. <clears throat> this conference started in like 2003 where there was a, a conference in Australia and then in 2004 or 6 they had a conference in Washington and this was the third one that they've done. At each of these conferences they spend, it's several days long, there's probably 2,000 people. They have like 15 sessions going on at the same time. The first day in this one they talked about science. Then they talk about management, then they talk about policy, then they talk about who knows what. Anyway, all, all the whole time what they're trying to do is drive forward the agenda on marine protected areas. <clears throat> marine protected areas are kind of complicated things because a lot of people don't like them. They think it sounds like excluding the ocean from use, so fishermen don't tend to like them. And, and even a lot of um, people who live nearby don't tend to like them because they don't know how they work and what they're all about. Very quickly, marine protected areas are just simply areas that are managed. You manage all of the activities that are going on within an area so that they are all contributing to a conservation objective. So you can still fish as long as the fishery is not jeopardizing the conservation objective for the area. Some of them are completely shut down. There's no fishing because if that's what the conservation objective is, that's what they do. One of the challenges with marine protected areas is people don't know what they are and people fear them, so there's a lot of resistance to them. And this conference and this group recognized that, so they saw the need to spend some time educating users, government practitioners, scientists on how to talk to people about why marine protected areas are important. And this is why we were there. That's what this was about. And I should have said earlier, but the conference entailed a lot of major stakeholders in conservation networks, so across the world, it wasn't just Canadian, it's international. Yeah, very large. Yeah, very sponsored large. IUCN was one of the core organizers, the French Marine Protected World Conservation Protection Area. I think yep. A lot of really big international bodies on conservation. Yeah. So. I just have a quick question. Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, it's, it's um, a three years uh, was that phoned in because uh, the. They're not on the conference call. They're hearing us through the microphone. Okay, good. Yes, they can hear us. We asked that before. Okay, sorry. To interrupt. That's okay. So it was um, we had a, a, a full representation at this conference from CWF. We had conservation group, education, communication, representatives from Learning Institute, board of directors, and the executive as well. This was uh, uh, definitely a large group effort and, and even larger than what, what we're showing here, I think. Yes. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about who was there and what we were doing. So the f we have four major parts to play when we're here at this conference. The one is the impact, the Ocean Plus Pavilion that we're going to focus on mainly because that was our main priority, I'd say, but we also did a lot of other really important things, which are these three here. So first we were involved, Grant Gardner, who's a member of our Learning Institute, he did an introductory plenary session. They were talking about science, the science education. It was the very first day of the conference. They opened it up. Uh, the workshop, Luba co-chaired a workshop about raising awareness on the role of MPAs in ocean conservation and sustainable development, and Sean also presented there as well. And then thirdly, Eve did a seminar on the power of short films to influence conservation. So we talked about his uh, Sir the Saint Laurent project as well as his humpback whale journey. But the main reason we were there was Ocean Plus Pavilion, which talked to you. Come in, well, you won't interrupt us at all. We don't wait. You can well, sit in the maybe. front, Jerry. So this is the, uh, this is the Ocean Plus Pavilion, yeah, to. just to give you a sense of sort of what it looked like. You guys have, may have seen this I guess there's this online somewhere where we go pro it and so on you guys can, can, come, can come in if you'd like <laughs> it was a it was a tiny little stage heavily lit very intensively warm really if you look sweaty. closely you can see me sweating a lot while I'm up there um, it was a, a large atrium back here that held maybe 75 to 100 people comfortably and um, and we just used the stage, had a, had a nice audio system, had a nice little video system as well. And so when we talk about the Ocean Plus Pavilion, this is what it looked like. They, uh, we had the opportunity to have this venue for an hour each day for day 
one, two, and three of the conference. So for an hour, we descended on this place and made it CWF. It also happened to be at the very end of the day, which was a perfect time for it. I think we had like the four o'clock to five o'clock slot. So it was a time when all the other uh, the simultaneous presentations that are going on ended, and people were just sort of done and brain dead and wanted to leave, and they would come into here and veg out on a couch and. I would yell at them. So that's what this was about. Um, so uh, we had an hour. We had a, a variety of CW labeled paraphernalia. You can see these blue umbrellas that I'm sure you were involved in producing. So we had a limited number, which worked really well because it almost came to fistfights at the end for them. And we would just decorate the stage with them and, and, and make our presence known and encourage people to come in and then just start going at it. And um, so that's what the Ocean Plus Pavilion looked like. And we, we tried a variety of formats every day. We were doing an interview, so Sean and I were co-hosting. Every day we would introduce the topics and we would interview people uh, focusing on various projects that CW has undertaken. It looked a little bit differently depending on what we did. So, like for example, we had Kaylin Skype in from Regina at one point. We're going to talk to you a little bit about that afterwards. We had people on stage talking to us. We had people presenting. We had videos going on. And we would follow a format every day. So we'd introduce the theme, which we're going to talk to you a little bit later. About what our themes were every day. And then we would interview people about the projects related to that theme. And then we would show a lot of multimedia. So we made sure to support it with got a lot of incredible videos that are really attention grabbing and they worked really well in this format, especially with the big screen in the background. And then we would reiterate our point and make sure that we drove home why we were doing this and how this connected to what you can do for conservation. And then we would we didn't take QA while we were doing it, but at the end we would leave about 15 minutes of our hour to actually talk one on one with people, which is a really valuable portion of Day. But the, the main point was that, that interview process, so it wasn't Christine and I up there talking about a project, we would bring someone up. Now, of course, we set them up beforehand and told them what to say, but we had an interview process so that we would be able to deliver the story through, through them, which is a bit more interesting. I think. A lot of people really liked it, and it certainly made us look like we were busy, because there was a constant flow of different people coming up on stage and going down and showing different videos. So. Okay. I think that's it. Okay. So on each of the three days, so as I said at the beginning, on each of the three days we had a different theme. One thing that made us real different from everyone else is we weren't talking about MPAs. I'm going to talk about the marine program tomorrow. One of the things you'll notice, we're not doing a whole lot on marine protected areas. We don't have a marine protected areas program. What CWF had to bring to the table here that everybody seemed to notice, which sort of got us involved and invited in this process, is we're very good at these three things in particular, connecting people, engaging people, and inspiring people to, to do conservation. And so we had to continually note this throughout our presentations that when we came in and started talking, we're not going to talk about marine protected areas, despite the fact that 2,000 or 3,000 people are there talking about marine protected areas. We were talking about tools and mechanisms that CWF has to accomplish all of these things. And the reason this is so valuable for establishing marine protected areas is what I was saying earlier. There's a lot of resistance to developing marine protected areas, even from conservation-minded people, because they don't know what it is or why we should bother conserving a marine area. And we said, this is what you need to do first. You need to do this to prepare the ground to become fertile so that you can plant an idea of a conservation objective or a conservation goal. And we're going to show you how CWF goes about doing it to encourage them to use it in whatever way they want, in this case for marine protected areas. So that's what that was about. So we're going to go through each day a little bit, talk more about the theme in particular, and then the projects that we highlighted that day. So the first day that we were there was connecting, and to us connecting was the initial contact that people would have with wildlife. So how, what's out there, how can you be involved, basically spreading the message of habitat, especially specifically Canadian in this case, but habitat and wildlife that's around us. And we presented it as the first step. It's what you need to do. If people, once again, we keep repeating this, if people don't have a connection to either the wildlife or the wild spaces, they're not going to see value in conserving it or anything else. So it was very valuable. So um, each day we had a variety of different projects. The four that we did on the four or five, the four that we did on the first day anyway were these. The first was the Great Canadian Turtle Race. We made a point of saying that, you know, these are unusual charismatic megafauna of the ocean. They live around Canada. People know nothing about them. And through the turtle race, we had an opportunity for people to follow them, learn about, a lot about the leatherback turtles, but also learn a lot about the oceans as well. As we presented each project, we also had aspect of 
was a real big we were really able to connect with people in a different platform that hadn't traditionally been done. Yeah. So we, we also talked about OR, so the African America's Row, and for this one we interviewed <laughs> we were talking about how this really connected with people because it was a human story. It was actually, they were able to follow these four guys going across the ocean unsupported, essentially. And Randy, so we have a video message from Adam, who couldn't be there, obviously, but was able to send through that one. And we also showed the webinar that, he, that Adam and John and kids, we talked about their capsize, so how the capsize was not really the goal of what we were going for, but that really helped us capture the attention of Canadians and Canadians. The next two we didn't really have interviews for. The first one was Sail for Wildlife, and we just briefly ran through these ones. Christine described this project as, once again, um, through the theme of Connect, we're trying to find innovative, non-traditional ways of connecting people to conservation messaging where they may not be familiar with it. And the Sail for Wildlife program was an, ex an example of that. Um, and we showed a clip of Damien talking to a bunch of kids learning to sail, I think. Damien wasn't there. He wasn't able to make it. He was preparing for a big race that happened a week later or something. But uh, we had lots of footage for it. Yeah, and we'll talk more about. We talked more about sports for wildlife the next day, so we'll talk about that. And then we had Saltwater Cities project, which Sean's going to talk to you more about tomorrow in terms of the conservation messaging. But we were focusing on how this is a really important international program that involves not just conservation, because a lot of what you're doing is the science of conservation, but we're also involving classrooms from across the world. So we've got French classrooms involved in this, and they're looking at how. How do their actions affect the ocean? So that was a really interesting sort of teaser into that program. We just played a short yeah. video message yeah. that I made at the beginning to encourage people to, to consider where their cities are and how they affect the ocean. The last thing I think is um, yeah. there was a, an art festival going on at the same time in this conjunction with the off, uh, the conference, what's it called? Like inspiring the sea, the sea the, how the sea something? inspires you or something like that. And um, so we had made a connection with the coordinator for the project, so we arranged to have him come up and have just five minutes at the end of every day, and he was very good, he only stuck to five minutes, just to, to talk about what it was. And, and once again, it's not a CWF project, but we immediately brought it forward when we saw it because we said this is an innovative way of connecting people to conservation and nature, something you've got to understand and look for these ideas. So we, uh, we took the opportunity to, to bring them up and showcase it each day as well. I guess we're going to show you... Let's see if it works. Have you seen this 3D model of these turtles swimming? <laughs> For me, it is. <laughs> and it was really, might not take too much. Yeah, it was really cool because we had the big screen behind us, so to have this kind of interesting stuff that people would look at, it was very different from. We were very popular with the, the people running the IT program because we were a huge challenge to them. And they loved it. And we would, they Christina really would good. leap the wall behind us to get back to, to the IT to run this model. And then they would, she would finish that and get back. Anyway, we worked really well. Check this out. <laughs> so imagine Toby, that a big. Is Toby here? Toby got this for us. This yeah. was. So you can go through all the different. So we kind of just. And then you can kind of spin around. All the different oh, turtles, the different cool, styles. Right? Yeah. You so, can see each of the ten turtles that we had, yeah, so you can see what's... Markings. So it was really cool, especially to show something like this on such a huge screen where... And we'll say this again and again, but one of the coolest things about showing all of these products that CWF has is watching the audience and the reaction that they had to it. It's so impressed them. It very cool. Or maybe it impressed me. <laughs> the next is the Adam's... Um, that is uh, Adam's... Uh, so this was the video message that Adam recorded for the presentation, which just talks a little bit about the Africa to America's role. Adam Creek here from the Africa to the Americas expedition. Myself and three others spent 73 days alone, unsupported, on a 29-foot rowboat. We took the slow route across the ocean, having time to experience the great outdoors, the wildlife that lives in there, and also observe the, the human impact on the huge ocean that we were rowing across. We got to swim with the whales. We saw pelagic seabirds who would fly for months at a time. We saw flying fish, uh, dorados. It was incredible to see all the wildlife that was out there. One time, I was rowing along, and my partner Pat was behind me. He shouted at me, watch out, watch out. And I looked over, and I saw 30 dots flying towards me. It was like TIE fighters flying towards the Death Star in Star Wars. <laughs> and uh, first, it was a flock of birds. 
Then we thought it was a flock of flying fish, and before I could think, I had to duck, and then all of a sudden, doo, 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 we got hit on the side of our bodies by these, these critters. And what were they? We looked down on the deck, and they were blue iridescent squid. They were absolutely gorgeous. Turns out that they were flying squid, and such beautiful uh, creatures uh, to observe, and like any adventurer would, um, alone in the middle of the ocean, we took these creatures and we ate them. They're very tasty. <laughs> uh, we also saw um, plastic every single day, and we were taking studies to understand how ocean acidification is affecting uh, affecting our oceans. Uh, the Canadian Wildlife Federation has been a great support uh, for the exploration of the wild, as well as bringing youth uh, closer to the wilderness, because we will not protect what we do not uh, experience and what we do not know and love. And through this adventure, we broadcast our stories into classrooms across North America and uh, into, into Africa as well. So thank you, CWF, and I'll turn it over to the stage for you to get more information on the CWF Africa to the Americas expedition. So, you know, keep in mind, we're just going to show you a video or two from each day, but we <laughs> show many videos on multiple projects each day just to be able to, to get these across. And they, they had great effects on, on people. And they're all on our website now. <coughs> so if you want to see all the videos that we showed, which yeah. there were a lot, they're there now. Good. Day two, yes. engaging. So the next day we were talking about engaging. So what we meant by engaging here at the beginning, once again, <laughs> apologizing for the fact that we weren't talking about marine protected areas, but that it is important that you demonstrate who is engaged in conservation efforts in your area and where there are opportunities for people, everyday people, to get involved and engaged in conservation. And that was the message that we were driving through on this second day. Mm -hmm. Oh, the first person that we interviewed was Eve, and he was talking about engagement in terms of his Sir Le Salem Rock project as well as the humpback whale journey. And what we were asking him about was basically what types of engagement did you see along the road? What were people doing for conservation along the St. Lawrence? But also, he was in the Dominican Republic, and we showed a bunch of videos from the vignette series of the. A couple of interviews. Uh, yep. So yeah, he was talking to a variety of people. Yeah. What was the next one? Oh yeah. So this was an this was not a Canadian Wildlife Federation project. This is a project from Parks Canada, who sort of helped invite us to go to this conference in the first place, but also proposed <coughs> this as an idea and we felt it fit within the engaged theme. This is a this was a video from a student a summer student program within Parks Canada where they were competing and creating little videos about who had the best summer job working in different parts of Parks Canada. And this is the one that won. It's from Guayanas on the West <coughs> Coast. Um, Cedar Peak, it's a it's a, a long video. We didn't play the whole thing for everybody to show it, but we really felt it fit in because it was talking about Parks Canada's role in protecting some of the most special places in Canada, they, how they're engaged in doing this as well, and how they are working to sort of involve students and in their efforts for conservation too. So it was a, a very compelling film that worked well. And also the First Nations component they worked well. Right? Yeah, that that's right. Well. So it had a lot of different elements. It's a really interesting video, but it's about eight minutes long. So It's kind of trippy, but it's okay to watch. <laughs> Luba?
Parts Canada approached us that, uh, that, uh, that they would like to have a sliver in there uh, so that they could profile their work, especially on the um, Aboriginal side. So, okay. Uh, yeah, so I wasn't. I wasn't yeah. sure about those details. We weren't very discriminatory in who we were bringing up, so it worked well. Yeah, it was oh, the same. Yeah, it was the same yeah. with the gentleman who was doing the um, uh, con uh, the arts. He inspires the arts show. Yeah. yeah, and then we did it with Environment Canada down the road. That's what. Yeah. Just after this one, we had Environment Canada come up because they were talking about the. Oh. They were they were just established the protected area, I believe. Or yeah, Triangle Islands. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So we also had Environment Canada come up right after Parks Canada on this day. And yeah, it was right after Parks. I think it was the third day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we then we interviewed Luba actually about the Sport for Wildlife program, and we were talking about engaging in different areas where there isn't always an opportunity to have conservation education, and Sport for Wildlife isn't always an obvious connection. So we had Luba come up and talk to us a little bit about what that looks like. This is one of the manuals that our education department has developed in collaboration with Damien, and we work really hard on it, but it's a, sailing, it's a manual for sailing instructors on activities they can use conservation-wise conservation with their instructors and their sailing programs, and we showed a video of a pilot workshop that we did in the PN, so local sailing. Around. It was really cool. Did we mention with Parks Canada, we interviewed Parks Canada? We Doug, interviewed Doug, Doug Yurick. Yurick, yeah. yeah. So we brought Parks Canada up to be the interviewer for that. And then we interviewed Luba for this project. Yeah. Sorry. So the last yeah. one that we showed for this day was the Love Your Lake program. This was um, the program uh, being driven in conservation right now, where this, this was an opportunity to show people how they can get engaged directly and personally in conservation efforts. So. Uh, cottage owners and, and lakefront property owners who may or may not now know how to appropriately manage their land so that it does not jeopardize habitat and wildlife in the adjacent lake. So this is the program that we're running now, but it's really nice because it, it demonstrates this really well and it fits in with everything else we're doing because it has a really cool little video that we showed everybody to get them all excited too. So this is the video, this is the last, well, we showed videos on each of these, and this is the video that we showed for the Love Your Lake program, which you may have already seen as well, but we're going to show you again. such effective videos and materials so keep in mind and once uh, once again um, keep in mind the audience who was watching this this was marine protected areas and we were talking about lakes you know this once again we were we were a methods presentation we weren't talking about marine protected areas we were there to say 
We have had success in cons conservation efforts. We've used a variety of tools for communication, connecting, engaging, and inspiring. And we show this. And here, here we are at a marine protected area showing our video about lake and lake management and lake conservation. It works. And we had to keep reminding them, you know, look outside of where people are working on the ocean for opportunities to, to create these situations where conservation can happen. And it worked very well. People, a lot of people came up and mentioned that to us, that rather than only thinking in marine protected areas, there are, are a broader range of conservation efforts that we can get involved with. And there were many, many sessions every day talking only about MPAs. So we were able to differentiate ourselves. So day three, the end was in sight. This is our last day. And we were really excited about it because the inspire part is the easiest one to talk to in some ways, or at least really easy to build excitement about. So by this what, point, we had spent yeah. so much time building one hour present 45 minute presentation on each of the previous days and lining these things up, we were pleased to get this over with. In a good way. <laughs> no, um, I was just pleased. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so the final day, our message was, you know, you can connect people, you can engage them, but if you don't inspire them to action, nothing will happen. So this day, we were looking at the action for us that we have at CWF. Um, the movement, the want. Yeah. How, do we, how do you create a want in people to act? You've connected them, you've showed them how they get involved, how do you compel them to get involved? And that's what we were able to convince them with these projects. So we started with Hinterland Who's Who, because we were framing it as a 50th birthday party for HWW. We drew Pam again. We dragged her up on stage. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really, it was a really incredible section. We spent a lot of time talking about HWW. We played the older ones. 1960s yeah. version of the gannet or something. You know, like, is that a gannet or a giant a pixel? Screen. I can't tell. Yeah. It was but, terrible quality. Yeah. One oh. person recognized it. I asked if anybody yeah. recognized the sound. One person did. No one else did, though. But that was OK, because it gave us a chance through the interview with Pam to talk about the incredible, iconic connection to Canadiana that Hinterland Who's Who is, and what, these, what this sound means as well as what the little vignettes mean and how they react to it and so on. So we probably played four or five of them. Mm -hmm. One thing that was very cool is after we played the really crappy ones, we went and played several of the good ones. And what a thing it is to watch an audience when they're seeing something they're happy to see. And remember, only one person had seen these videos before. No one else had seen them or knew about, heard about Hinterland Who's Who. And everybody was so happy to watch them. 30 second, 60 second clip. We did English and French. Other weeks, we did stick to the marine ones just to just to, to, to match in narwhal and leatherback turtle and gannets and so on. But uh, what a great reaction to people who had never seen Hinterland Who's Who before. And we were able to explain that this is something that's been going on for 50 years. And this, among everything else, you know, seems to be the, the, the jewel in the crown in terms of creating wildlife as a component of what Canada is. And they were quite convinced by that. And we talked a bit about the 50th anniversary and the search for the lost footage. So oh, yeah. how did that inspire people to action? I mean, social media, people were searching for this. And what a great story. It's like yeah. Canadian national news. It's like, where did that Gannett film go? And all of Canada wants to know where that Gannett film is. How cool yeah. is that? Yeah. And I think in the the end of that day, we talked more about Gannets than yeah. a lot of the other projects that we talked about. Well, at the so end of the day, we were, we were saying earlier that people would come up and mob us. And a guy named Charles Shepard. Anybody here know Charles Shepard? No? Big time seabird researcher from the UK? Just you. No? <laughs> anyway, so he came up to me and asked me about subspecies on gannets because of this. And me, I'm like, mm, well, what's that over there? <laughs> so I didn't have the answer for this fellow. But anyway, he was a big time researcher and he was fascinated by the, the gannet video. So it was really great. So. Yeah, and someone else oh. came and he was tracking gannets. The guy was talking yeah, about. Like, they, they, wanted wanted to do it. they really liked the gannets. I had to bone up on my gannets yeah. next time. <laughs> um, Voices of the North. Yeah. So here we interviewed Randy. If you guys don't know what this project is, this is uh, uh, some work that CWF did where a number of short vignettes were made interviewing or, or having people who live in the North speak to the different features of the North and provide these online for educational purposes or, or informational purposes. The video, so we interviewed Randy about it and how this is used to inspire people, particularly the connection between Canadians and the Arctic, where is it, which is a place many of us will never get to, so it's sort of a sense of mis mystery and, and interest for us. Um, we showed the video of a, of a, a hunter from Pangerton who was speaking in his own language, uh, describing movements and distributions of seals and so on. So that was, 
was something very different, especially where we had him up speaking in this language that nobody there understood. And that really captured people's attention because they, they would hear it over the loudspeakers. And yeah, it was very loud. And then we interviewed Grant, came up state, up on, talked about the Learning Institute and the Summer Institute. So something we run in education every year, we bring 10 to 12 educators to a habitat, to a location they may not otherwise get to visit. This is a picture from our last year's Summer Institute, and we had Grant talk a little bit about why we bring them up there. So we get them to experience the North, learn about the habitat wildlife, talk to government and scientists and educators that are up there, and then bring those lessons back to their classroom, which is a really important aspect of what CWF is focusing on, at least in the North right now. And we showed, so while they were up there, they were filming videos of what they saw. Each team of two did about a two-minute video about various things like climate change, uh, we showed one that was they went muscle picking with a local woman, uh, an elder, and it was really it was really interesting. It's a really interesting project, and Grant spoke to them. And then, oh. So the last one was the uh, Inspire contest, where that we have in partnership with Ten Trees. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we brought in Kaylin for a Skype interview, which was the next the challenge of the day for the IT department, and it worked. It worked so really well. Long. I don't know if you guys saw these videos or not, but it was amazing. Here he was in Regina, eight hours behind us, and we were in France. We're like, hey, Kaylin, how's it going? Tell us about this project. And he was able to do that. So we talked about how the whole point of the project is for people, if you don't know, for people to produce short videos and send into Tentree to say, here's what inspires me. Here's why I like nature. Here's where I go and what I like to do. And to, to start it off, Tentry has 10 or 15 videos up there of, of a variety of very inspiring people doing some amazing stuff in nature. And and we really tried to say that, well, I mean, the day was the day's theme was about inspiring. And we're like, what a mechanism is this? There's, of course, so much energy in it. Many of the videos are exciting, and we're going to show you one of the most exciting ones here. Uh, but the, the point was, once again, coming back to it, you've got to try and find these mechanisms to try and inspire people and show them what's happening. And it's really amazing. When you start seeing what CWF has the capability to do to create all of these situations, it's, it's quite exciting. And also, they're focusing on a youth market, which is one of really important demographic, I should say, not market, but <laughs> demographic for CWF. So it's how do we get youth involved and inspired to care about the outdoors, and Tentry is a really good example of that. And it's really high energy. It was a nice way to end our day with something that would really excite people and then want to get involved. I think we have the video. Have you guys seen the video of Jeb? Who here would watch Jeff? Oh my god. Nobody good. Yeah, good. This, this was really cool to watch the audience too. How exciting. <laughs> Since I was a very small child, I remember, wa remember watching birds opening their wings and flying. And I remember telling my aunts, I'm going to do that when I get older. And she looked at me and she's just like, Jeb, that's impossible. If you think that something can't be done, there you go. It can't be done. But if you think that something can be done, then as a human being, we're capable of figuring out how to be impossible. Possible. Yeah, he's falling. <laughs> and what it has to do with is it has to do with overcoming fear. absolutely am scared of the things that I do. I'm not a superhuman. I'm just like everybody else. And when I'm afraid, it's before, it's like the thought of doing something is what's scary. That uncertainty, that questioning, should I do this? What could happen? What could go wrong? And what's really quite interesting is that sheer terror is right up until you step off. The instant you step off, you're no longer scared. You're in that moment. There is no yesterday. There is no tomorrow. There's only what's happening right this second. And the sensation, the feeling of becoming successful after being so scared and overcoming that fear it brings you this sense of peace and fulfillment and happiness that I just can't describe. It 
There's like 15 of these videos. Although that is one of the coolest ones, I think. That's cool. But how, like, you know, like we don't, we didn't have to try and inspire this audience to be impressed with what CWF, the kind of messaging <laughs> and tools that we're using to create these things. I mean, they just spoke for themselves, and, and we were able to do this. Right after this, we finished with the Ten Tree, um, the, the I forget what it's videos. called, the Inspire. Uh, fairly high energy, well edited video showing people doing stuff in nature with lots of you know thumping music going on, and and uh, we had the greatest reaction from that. People were dancing and everything, so it was really mm -hmm. impressed to see. It was nice. Sean danced a bit on the stage. Did you get a video? <laughs> we sure do. All right. Right. Where is it? <laughs> I'm holding it hostage. So. Okay. I was going to crowd surf, but they wouldn't come closer. Okay. Anyway, so um. So that was what we did over the three days. Um, so, you know what 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 CWF was able to accomplish. What we accomplished at at this event by the numbers are pretty straightforward. We had um, an across the uh, Ocean Plus Pavilion as well as the three presentations that we did within the normal section. We figured we had six to eight hundred people uh, viewing at at different times. Um, we did. We profiled 15 or 16 different projects. We showed more than 30 videos. We had so the five sessions as well, and we had four to five hours of time that was spent at this conference where we were talking CWF stuff, which is what this was about. So why is this viewed as a success? What are some of the things we think we think one of the major ones that you probably already said already, but it, we stood out from the pack. We were really different from what other people were doing there because we weren't just talking heads on a stage. We were actually showing concrete examples of what CWF has done to achieve these. They were really exciting examples and people were enthusiastic about the projects and the science behind it and, and uh, all the different varieties and methods that we use to reach people and to connect to patients. We had, that was one of the things that worked well in this thing too is where Christine and I had a chance to do this and take advantage of using Pam and, and Luba and others and bringing it up. You know, we weren't, um, we were collectively presenting one project, but showing it from the conservation science side, from the communication side, from the educational side, and we were able to, we were able to dance whatever dance they wanted to do because we had the ability to address these projects from from multiple sides, and that made a big difference as well. And it was nice to show the projects that we're doing that combine all the different facets of our organization. It isn't just an education. Even How within, communications. yeah, what we showed that not all of these are communication <laughs> programs or education. In fact, we had all all sort of groups involved in this as well. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was that was really key was what a huge effort this was too. We kept uh, saying that we were simply the pointy end of the stick. They were seeing the end of this, but I'm sure many of you see design products you were involved with, ordering, organizing the travel. Producing digital content for this, producing online content for this, and then of course all the work that goes into creating because each one of these video productions isn't simply a video production. There's so much more that goes on behind it, and we tried to show that too. And it really, it really established CWF as a presence because when we said, well, this isn't just this isn't just video. This is a project we have on the go, and these aren't even all the projects that we have on the go. We have more than this. You know, there was a real sense of who is this CWF thing and what's going on, even even among many uh, uh, people who are from different countries as well as Canadians yeah. who were there. So I think the connections we made in the last 15 minutes after having basically yelled at them for 45 minutes what, were really valuable because there were people from international organizations that were impressed with what CWF was doing and will lead to connections that are, I think, will be very valuable for us in the future. And yeah. they were really impressed with them. Dan and then Luba. I just had a quick question. Were you guys filmed? Thanks, Dan. We were supposed to mention that. Yes. You can go to the website. We have hours and hours of Sean and I talking. If you'd like to watch it, it's all on As CWF well as website. all the links as well. Three hours of us talking. Stuff, so. <laughs> They're kind of grainy quality because all we did, almost at a last second thought, we thought, oh, let's stick a GoPro up. And we just turned on a GoPro and stuck it up and yeah. videoed us. So it's kind of poor quality. That's what these clips are, the pictures of us are. Yeah. Screenshots from the GoPro, so you can watch it all.
Yep. And you can even play them all, I think, as well, right? Yes, there's playlists for each day, and then they're individual. If you just want to see Eve's interview, you can just watch Eve's interview. If you want to see our introduction, you can see that. And what we showed you here in 30 minutes or so, it took us three hours over three days, and, and, and we showed much more video. We, we've only showed you two or three. Luba? I um, just wanted to make a comment on uh, what was achieved here. Um, so th the total audience at this particular Congress was 1,200. So oh, well over half participated uh, as the viewing audience and mingling with us. Uh, so you know that, that in itself shows that we were an attraction. Um, this went on all day, and at the end, we were, we were actually towards the end of uh, the working day here, and uh, uh, so our crowds were focused uh, over the course of the day. I would say at least any time I noticed, um, and I was kind of in the back of uh, the pavilion. Now, the other thing is, is that um, we made uh, many important connections just networking, but uh, their ocean ambassador, William Lingham. Uh, he's Canadian. He set the world record for free diving. And um, uh, he's from. So he came up and met with us. He was there he every was day. Yeah. He was really cool. behind us. And uh, the message, for the message he carried back to ICN, UCN should do stuff like this. Uh, never mind, like, we're the only one. So there's really great feedback. Um, and lots of buzz, so it created a lot of buzz. Mm -hmm. So, uh, also, Parks Canada, they were our guests uh, for the presentation. And um, I, I, I could see with the finger there with pride. Mm -hmm. um, and I spoke with William yesterday, and he said, you know, our uh, participate, like in his participation, he said, whenever I went to the impact, uh, your presentations, CWFs, uh, it made me feel proud to be Canadian. And I think every Canadian who was attending there, because we held a dinner before uh, we actually engaged in this, uh, in the Congress. And so we put all the Canadians together. And uh, that was a common theme, like, I'm really proud to be Canadian. Uh, and you could see that, because they also kind of joined us in spirit and uh, mingled with the crowd, you know, telling them, I'm Canadian, you know, mm -hmm. wearing my Canadian. <clears throat> so um, it was really something of, uh, within that audience of, of how something like this, so very well done um, by the two of you, it really boosted our image, but Canada also, uh, just because. Well, it definitely made a difference. There were a lot of Canadians there, maybe 15 or 20. Some were aware of the breadth of what we do, but many weren't. And I think we also impressed a lot of people with that. And we kept emphasizing that that this wasn't even the whole thing. This wasn't the whole deal. But what worked really well, one thing that was worked really well for us, and, and maybe Christine had mentioned it, is, is this multimedia approach. We had video or technology to show for every one of these projects. And it made it, especially in this format, made it very... I don't know, attractive. It certainly drew people in to see it. And, and even even for me, anyway, as we were putting this together, I was thinking, holy smokes, we got a lot of stuff here. Like, just in this multimedia side, we have way more projects on the go that don't have multimedia stuff associated with them. But having this is extremely valuable and made a really big difference in, in drawing that attention. I think that might be everything. It was, um, it was something that uh, we clearly tried to show made a big difference, as I said. CWF, we kept emphasizing, is not a big organization, and, and so, um, you know, to, to pull off the range of what we did and what we showed here takes this tremendous effort of a lot of people here in Canada, and, and Christine and I simply stood on the stage and, and presented it and showed what it was all about, but the, the depth and range of what it takes to accomplish it goes, goes way, way back, and, and I think we've got a good chance of getting that out. We got a lot of credit for it when we didn't really deserve it. That is for sure. <laughs> I was going to say, I just remembered seeing the, uh, these were high demand. We didn't produce yeah. very many of these, maybe 70 or 80 or something. And so people were scrambling for them. We only gave away 20 or so each day, and people would come up. And, and uh, I started a small black market, but it's okay. <laughs> I did all right. Anyway, it was really cool because um, one night we went out 
to for dinner. I don't know how big Marseille is. Surely it's big. And someone was walking along carrying an umbrella, a CWF umbrella. And we were like, ooh, that's good. So yeah, well, I mean, if anybody has any questions, we'll be happy to answer. But we just wanted to take a chance to show you what this was all about because because um, you know this this was something that accomplished more than I expected, and it's something that was only accomplished because we were all sort of working on it, despite the fact that it was us up there yammering on about it. So, uh, so I wanted to give you guys a chance to see it. The videos are all up online if you want to watch them. This was the short version, and um, if anybody has any questions, we can answer. Otherwise, we can let you go.